Hi guys, welcome back to our channel. My name is Shay. I am a full-time reseller on Poshmark, eBay, and Macari. I am Tyler, part-time seller on Macari, Poshmark, eBay. And there is a silence around us. There is no Luna. She is at daycare today because oh, we have God. to go to a wake later today. So yeah, we didn't want her to be stuck in a cage. So yeah, she's probably extremely happy and we get to do a quiet video. Nice change. Yep. Yeah. So today's video is going to be uh, about Lula Rich. You guys had mentioned in one of our videos, we asked you if you wanted to hear that. And a lot of you said yes. So we are going to do that. So we're going to do kind of a comparison between Poshmark and Lula Rich since we've seen that a lot on Lula Rich. Not Lula Rich, technically. Well, the Lula Rich uh, documentary. Yeah. So uh, I think you wanted to start off with your thoughts, but we should probably do your t-shirt. I do have a new t-shirt. I think it's, we missed this last yeah, week. Yeah, I'm kind of a big deal. Uh, well, last week it was a redo because this had to go through the wash. Are you kind of a big deal? Uh, I'd like to think so. Oh, wow. That's hurtful. <laughs> well, anyways, uh, so yeah, so we are going to talk about that. So do you want to talk about your thoughts first? Because uh, so you didn't know what to expect going I didn't this. really have any kind of frame of reference for this. When I saw the, the docuseries Lou the Rich, first off, I was amazed that they were they got the founders to sit down for that. Because it seemed like they tricked them. It's, it felt like they were making it seem like they were doing like a positive, like, you know, documentary. <laughs> Get and your just, side of the story out there. That's what it felt like. Uh, I mean, I didn't have any realize, realization that they were that shady. I mean, I shouldn't be surprised. There are a lot of shady people out there, but. Yeah. Um, I, so I didn't even know this was a thing until I saw it all over the Instagram community for resellers. Um, this was available on Amazon Prime. So if you haven't seen it, that's where you can find it. Um, but yeah, so it was surprising to me, but also not. So as I kind of teased in a previous video, I am a past MLMer, not LuLaRoe, because I did not ever see how spending $5,000 on a business made sense. Um, but I did do it works. And so we will sprinkle in kind of stuff about that as we talk about it. Um, but the biggest thing that surprised me, I feel like is the initial idea was actually a good idea. Like she came up with skirts. She sewed them herself and she went and sold them at people's homes to make a profit. Yeah. And then other people wanted to sell her skirts. So she sold them wholesale to them. So Don't they could sell the skirts. No, I was like, get it, girl. You made a business. That's great. Like if it stopped there and that's how the business grew was selling wholesale to people. I mean, get it. That's like, just reselling. You're buying something to then resell. Well, it's not even reselling. Just, it's retail. Yeah. Like that's, I was surprised. Yeah. It seemed... And maybe it's maybe it's a woman in me, so you can you can check me here. But it seemed like the man pushed it. In that oh direction. no, he's he's the sketchy one of the two of them, or the the most sketchy of the two of them. Yeah. Clearly, it, it felt very much like he kind of saw what she had, and he's he saw dollar signs and decided yeah. to exploit it. That's what it felt to me. I think he also was the one pushing the nepotism and getting all of his family into there, yeah. which is problematic. Yes, and, and at the end of the day, money corrupted both of them. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of my feelings on it. Yeah, it's it's kind of a money corrupts kind of document documentary. Yeah. So. So, anyways, if you like this type of content and you want us to do more things uh, where we're comparing or talking about uh, other relevant stuff in the community, make sure that you let us know and comment that down below. I'm happy to look at this kind of stuff. We both kind of love documentaries, so yes, we do. You know. Uh, but also make sure you subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell so you're notified every time we post new videos, post new videos every Sunday and Wednesday. And I'm hoping to start posting a few more lifestyle type videos, you know, maybe a prank here and there or something like that. So that's oh, something you're oh, interested joy. in. Oh, joy. I have a great idea and one of you particularly no. will adore it. So if you are interested in that, leave me a comment and let me know so that I know that there'll be some interest, um, but it'll be great. And no, it won't. I, I know full well that it won't. So let me know. Uh, okay, so let's get right into it. So Lula Rich versus Poshmark. So we wrote a few ideas down here. Hopefully it won't be too all over the place. The first thing that we wrote down is they both target young women and or stay at home moms. Yeah, I think that's very clear from their, well, Lula, Lula Rowe, their marketing was exclusively stay at home moms and young women. Uh, same with Poshmark. We struggled to find any video or advertisement for Poshmark that had a man involved. <laughs> Yeah, so when we sat down to research this, we already knew that Lula, LuLaRoe did this because it was very prominent in the documentary. And I said, you know, I don't know if Poshmark does this because all the videos I've seen were just, you know, you can buy Louis Vuittons for $50, which is ridiculous. But 
Um, that's all I had seen. So I Googled, you know, advertisements and clicked on a bunch of them and kept scrolling. And oh, that does, they were doesn't exist. all women. And then I finally found a man and I was so excited. I clicked on it and he was a buyer. So they're clearly targeting women. Yeah. Um, there was a mom in one of them uh, saying that she could provide for her family with the money she made on oh, get, Poshmark. Get deals for her family. Yeah. Spend $10 when she'd spend 50 at the store. Yeah. It's, another one said something about... Um, taking her shopping addiction and making money off of it. And I'm like, oh, that's problematic. Ooh. Yeah, that's basically like the casino taking the, the clocks out of the building so that you don't know how much money you've spent. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like it's problematic for a lot of reasons. Yeah, now MLMs are well known for targeting this demographic. I think a lot of it is because women have this draw to stay home with their families while also still helping provide for the household. Yeah. And I think we all have fallen into this trap at some point in life. That is one of the things that did draw me to an MLM. I wanted to stay at home. I didn't know if I wanted a family or what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to stay at home and be my own boss and not worry about somebody else. And that was a big draw. And I know that it was a predatory thing. Um, but it's, it's scary to see that even Poshmark, something that I love so much, definitely seems to fall into that trap. I mean, there's nothing wrong with going after your target audience and knowing and identifying that target audience to a degree. I mean, the main problem I have with MLMs is they target you with the idea that Anyone can do it and you're going to make money, which is not It's so easy. Yeah. Anyone, anyone can do it. Anyone can do it and you can make 10000 or 100000 or whatever it is from your couch. And there's, you just push a few buttons, you talk to your friends and you make money. And that's not, that's not how it works. And that is how the Poshmark ads also came off as well. It was yeah. very much a, I just posted my dress for sale and then it sold and I made money. And not to say Poshmark's the only one that does this. Makari also has done it. Other people do it. But it, it, it's, a, it's a creepy vibe. Uh, the next thing I did want to talk about was the cult-like atmosphere. Now, this this is way more seen in LuLaRoe. And I'm going to say that 100%. They have a religious undertone. If you haven't seen the documentary, watch it because that is the creepiest thing I've ever seen in my life. Very much a, the man is the center of the universe and the women must follow because of their religion. Were they more Mormon? Uh, something like that. I'm not I'm sure, Mormon. honestly, what but... the religion was, but... Um, Whatever it was, they perverted it to be something really just awful. Well, it's it's also, on top of that, they were looking at, well, it's all millennials. So what do millennials and Gen X women want? It's uh, Saved by the Bell Slater was the first guest. And they just, I mean, they killed it. They, they understood the assignment. And they all had to wear the LuLaRoe clothing. And it, yeah. it was just a cult vibe. Um, I didn't think Poshmark had that. Until oh, they, they kind of do. I found an article from 2014, and it talked about the posh life hashtag. And basically, it was, you need to show everyone that you're living the posh life. And, you know, share yourself living that posh life, whether you're wearing Poshmark clothing, or you went on vacation because Poshmark paid for it, or all of these type of things. And it felt yeah. very culty. Like... We're, we're, a lot of us resellers like to think of ourselves as business owners. You know, we've, we've cultivated this inventory and we're selling it at a markup and we're, you know, doing all these things, but we're not part of a cult. We don't need to be wearing all Poshmark clothing or we don't need to be saying that Poshmark paid for these. I did that. Poshmark didn't do that. I did that. You, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a weird vibe and I, I'm not really a fan. It's just, it's going further down the rabbit hole of trying to build an artificial community when you don't need an artificial community. You just need to sell things and you need to provide a platform for doing that. Yes. Uh, I'm going to skip a little bit here to, I'll go back to, but um, because you mentioned the speakers yeah. at the uh, LuLaRoe convention, uh, Poshmark also has Poshfest. So LuLaRoe convention was very much, you know, kind of getting everyone together, getting this like chanting situation going on. Uh, listening to the founders tell you how they're going to make all this money and do all this stuff. Um, it was creepy. And you paid money to basically be preyed on, is what it felt like from the documentary. Yeah. I think there is kind of that aspect at Posh Fest, because they don't really listen to what the the dedicated sellers are asking for. They It's it's more, I've done this, and you can too. And Now, I, I'm going to say openly, I have not been to Posh Fest. I have heard that it is very... Um, not useful um, for most of the sellers who are making a decent amount of money. It seems to prey on those who are newer to reselling. 
Um, however, I am happy to be wrong on that. And please leave me in the comments below if you found it very useful. Um, I do pick up clips, uh, especially when they talk about the new releases of things that are coming up, uh, but I don't need to pay money for that. That's going to be, you know, coming. So I'll see it. Oh. Um, but that said, um, one of the things that does feel a little inauthentic, I guess, is that the majority of the valuable information that seems to be provided is from us in the community. Now, I am not big enough to ever be invited to Poshfest, obviously, but those that are, um, I have heard, have not been compensated. And when asked to be compensated, they have been denied. Um, and that, to me, is taking advantage of those who have helped get your company to where they are. Um, while Poshmark is, a, you know, obviously going to do well all on their own, if you do need sellers to give you that content, they should be, I think, compensated well, for that. Their time has value. I mean, even if it's just paying for the rooms and getting the exposure of being one of the keynote speakers at Posh, Posh Fest, they shouldn't have to pay for it out of pocket. They shouldn't have to do you a favor by showing up to your event. Yeah, it, it, it gives me a little bit weird vibes. But so. as for not going to Posh Fest, it is really hard for me to say if you get that cult-like atmosphere as it seems that LuLaRoe has. And so let us know. I have heard a lot of things. It sounds like it might be. But let me know in the comments. I'm curious to know what your experience has been if you have been to Posh Fest. It also seems like a lot of the stuff that they do for that and tailoring Poshfest and the changes to the platform is is more about building that community rather than making it easier to sell things. <laughs> oh, really? You notice that? Well, they don't provide anything really helpful for you to run a business. They don't provide you with analytics like eBay. They don't provide you with a 1099 so that you can pay your taxes. I see, I see we've moved on to another bullet point, yes. yes. Um, so I have heard that analytics are coming. I have actually seen a nice little pie chart that has been introduced. I don't have access yet. Um, it's not on my app, but I have heard it's coming. However, if that's all that's offered in comparison to eBay, I'm still disappointed. eBay does give quite a lot of analytics and they keep building that out more and more. Um, you can tell uh, that their demographic is quite different. Um, I'll leave that there. Um, but if you want us to be successful sellers, we do need information. I want to know what my best selling brand is. I want to know what my sell through rate is. I want to know, you know, what's trending right now and what of my items are in that trending category. You have this information, just give it to me. So that's a little bit frustrating and it feels very much like we're, if, if, if the analytics I've seen are what we're getting, we're getting pretty visuals instead of, you know, I want a spreadsheet. I want data. I want things that I can use and manipulate and, and use to my benefit. Um, just because I'm a female doesn't mean that that's not useful to me. So we'll see how it goes. Maybe it's going to get better over time, but it did take an awful long time, even if it is getting better. Um, as for the 1099, that's also important. We're business yeah. owners. We are responsible for reporting our income to the IRS. Now, I cannot give you any tax advice. But I can say that when you run a business, you do have a tax liability. So you can, I, this is not tax advice. Pay your taxes that you are, <laughs> that you owe. Like right. that's just. And it would be nice if the platforms we sell on provided us information to make that easier to know what we actually have to, you know, report and use all those numbers, whatever it is. It would be really helpful if the platforms gave that to us rather than us having to, you know, really keep track of it on our own. But Again, that doesn't seem like to be a priority, although I do think a law has been enacted recently where that may be changing. Well, I think they're going after people that are underreporting, specifically the super wealthy, but it, it may very well catch a lot of people that are not paying their taxes. Fairly. Yeah. So, so. I, again, another thing that would be nice to have, and I do believe other platforms have it, and yeah. Um, okay, then from there, uh, okay, so this starts getting into... The things that I think most people are really comparing, but I don't think it's necessarily Poshmark's fault. It's kind of the side effect of having a cult-like atmosphere. Um, so fake representation of your business. So yeah, this I, is... I think that's more just to do with the change in social media these days. I don't think it's Poshmark's fault that you want to show a highlight reel on Instagram or wherever. I don't think it's their responsibility to be upfront with other person, other people's content. So what I'll say here is, so on Lula Rich, the, the reason this was brought up is because uh, some of the top sellers were talking about how they were told 
that you're not selling leggings. You're selling a lifestyle. Yeah. You need to show that you went on this great vacation. You need to show that you're wearing this great clothing. You have a Louis Vuitton. You're doing this. You're selling a lifestyle. Regardless of whether or not you're living that lifestyle, that's what you're selling. And this you can see with the Poshmark sellers for sure because you see the fake package photos, right? I mean, that's the big one. You see people that have these package photos that are like 50 packages. And then if you look at their solds, that's not matching match. up. Either they've collected a bunch of days work together uh, or they've put empty boxes, which people have been accused of. Different things. Or maybe they ran a sale and everything that they sold was like for $5 and they lost money. Either way, it's a misrepresentation of what's going on. And the only only way that I could blame Poshmark a little bit for this is those Posh campaigns. So there are Posh campaigns on your, on your um, Poshmark under seller tools. I don't do them anymore because they give you usually like $5 with the exception of like the Halloween one where you got 20 bucks. Um, but it asks you to do things like, you know, talk about your favorite Posh find or talk about, you know, this wedding thing or talk about... They give you these prompts, right? And you're you're basically meant to promote Poshmark in a way that's beneficial to them. And I get it. It's a great marketing tactic, but you're compensating me yep. Posh credits to then use on your platform. So it's a little little uh, circle. Yeah, oh, it, I almost said a bad word there. <laughs> it's definitely it's a self fulfilling and self perpetuating kind of thing, mm, and it's yes. very self serving. Yeah. And as for the sellers who do this, I do think it is a very much a lot about keeping appearances and trying to look like you are a bigger seller than you are. I and think it's a lot of the fake it till you make it. It's you want to look like you're this big, big deal so that when you are, you're you're willing it into existence. And I get that. But at the same time, there has to be some kind of transparency and accountability because more so with the LuLaRoe, they were selling a dream and, and for... For securities, which I work in, it's basically fraud. You're basically misrepresenting reality to then be able to sell something. Yeah. And, and let's also be very clear, and you know, this is going to kind of go into our last point here, um, but some people do this because to, be, to make money and the kind of money that a lot of people want to make uh, by full-time reselling, Oftentimes people need to diversify their income. And I want to say, first of all, there's nothing wrong with that. It is absolutely valuable yeah. to get knowledge from somebody who has done this already and knows what they're doing. Um, but some people need to fake it a little bit to start getting that traction yeah. to be able to monetize YouTube or be able to monetize their Instagram or be able to sell a course, all of those things. And that's where it gets a little bit predatory because you're not being honest about where you are in your business. And then you're then asking other people for money when you're not being honest about who you are. So yeah. the, the authenticity is a little bit shady. Now, I don't blame Poshmark for that, but I can see how it happened. In my view, it's almost like creating your own separate downline independent of Poshmark. So with LuLaRoe, you had payments for all of the people that were buying from you and below you. With Poshmark, it's, it's you're not... There's no component of that in Poshmark itself, but there is very much a, a almost predatory nature at times of capitalizing on newer, inexperienced people to supplement your income reselling because either that's not enough or you're just looking to increase the number so that you can show that you're successful when really it has nothing to do with selling clothing or selling in general. Yeah, so I see you, you use our next point. You, yeah. you, you lump that in there. So yes, increasing your downline. Um, so this is complicated, right? So in LuLaRoe, it's very obvious that the downline is you recruit people to sell with you and they sell skirts and you get paid off of the skirts that they sell, right? Now with Poshmark, it's not quite the same. Um, with, what people are doing is they're selling a course or they're getting monetized on YouTube or they're you know selling planners or they're doing closet critiques or whatever the case may be and they're getting uh, paid for that. Um, there are predatory ways in which people are doing this, where they're selling inventory that a seasoned reseller would know is not worth the money, and they're they're capitalizing off We've of that. We've done several videos on that yes. in the past. <laughs> um, there are people that are selling closet critiques where either they're not actually completing them, or they're giving advice or information that is subjective at best. Take better photos, and then taking $20, and yeah. not actually looking at it. You need better keywords and pay me $20. Yes. 
Yeah, pay me so $100, they it is. know that it's subjective information, but they know the other person doesn't know better. So yeah. they're taking advantage of that. So they are kind of building their own downline because this person is, these people are becoming dependent on them for more and more information and more and more tips. And they know that they're not going to grow as quickly as they'd like. So they know they're going to keep coming back for more. And it's this, you know, again, this circle type situation where it's just predatory and it's gross. It's a pyramid. It's you're using your influence to generate revenue, which if you are doing it honestly and ethically, I have no problem with that. But if you're taking advantage of people, I very much have a problem with just taking advantage of someone because you can. Yeah. And that's where I do want to separate LuLaRoe from Poshmark. There is an ethical way to do Poshmark and be part of the community. And there are a lot of people who are doing a great job doing that. Um, yeah. But running a business, being transparent, um, you know, sharing what you're comfortable sharing. Nobody has to share their numbers if they're not comfortable, all that type of stuff, but sharing the true and honest, whatever you're comfortable sharing. And then if you are offering services, offering services that are beneficial to the people you're offering them to and being authentic with what you're offering, you know, telling people this advice works for me and my model. But well, just but, be upfront that you are not necessarily going to be able to capitalize on this. I have built this over time and it, it's not something that's going to work for you right away. It's not, oh, you just need a hundred thousand followers on YouTube, Instagram, wh wherever, and then you'll be fine. These are the things that I did to get there. And it's going to be a process and a, a slow build. Yeah. It, it's not something that's going to work overnight. And disregarding the fact that you're making money off of your following is just not ethical. It's you, you can't just ignore your following and the money that you're making from it. Yeah, exactly. So, so anyways, I do think there is a way to do this ethically. I don't think that Poshmark is a pyramid scheme, but I do think that we as a community do have to be better at promoting those who are doing things the correct way and, and kind of turning the other way to those who aren't. I don't believe in bullying. I don't believe in putting people down. I don't believe in smear campaigns, all that kind of stuff. We can do better by putting our energy towards those who deserve it. Yeah. Um, I will say that there are resellers that I know that are killing it out there who don't even get recognized because they're too authentic, I feel, and mm -hmm. people aren't excited about that. So a few that I will link in my, in my, uh, bio here, uh, Cajun reseller is an incredible stuffed animal reseller and he just doesn't get enough, uh, excitement. And I don't know why, because he's great and I've learned a ton of things. Um, I think, uh, Resale Dojo is amazing at DVDs and, you know, all of the media content, books, all that kind of stuff. Electronics, everything. Yeah. Everything. Uh, again, is so underrated and doesn't get enough attention. Um, and then I'll also say Murray Life, who has done an amazing job at showing that you can market on TikTok in a way that is fun, exciting, and, you know, showing a different category of people how important reselling is and how it is, you know, important for sustainability. And again, not enough attention. So I think what we need to do as a community is direct our attention to those who are doing it the correct way and yeah. move our attention away from those who aren't. And if we can do that, we will separate ourselves from these shady, creepy, just If you self-police it and build a better community and build up the people that are helpful in doing things the right way, I think that's gonna go a long way. Absolutely. So that is what I have to say. Hopefully you guys found this interesting. Hopefully this is helpful for you. And if you have watched this and you have more thoughts, I would love to hear them. So put them down yeah. below. We try to respond to all the comments and kind of engage with you. So hopefully uh, you found this interesting, but that is everything we have. We will be back very soon with a new video. So thank you guys so much for watching. Yeah, and too long didn't watch the video. Lularoe is a scam. Don't, don't support them at all. Thank you all for watching.